Mary Kramer joined Crane's Detroit business in April 1989 as editor. In 1990, she was named associate publisher and was named publisher in 2005, responsible for sales, circulation, and editorial operations. In 2013, she added the Crane publication in Cleveland to her portfolio. Crane's Detroit business, celebrating its 30th anniversary in 2015, covers business news in the five-county metropolitan Detroit area. Its award-winning website breaks news every day, and the weekly print edition reaches an estimated 140,000 people each week. A resident of Detroit, she is the first woman to be elected president of the historic Detroit Athletic Club. She holds honorary doctorates from three state and two private colleges and universities in Michigan. And Governor Rick Snyder appointed her to the Board of Trustees at Grand Valley State College in 2013. Her previous daily newspaper experience includes editing positions at, at the Kalamazoo Gazette, Grand Rapids Press, Ann Arbor News, the Greenwich Time in Connecticut, and the Buffalo Courier Express in New York. So it is my honor to introduce Mary Kramer. Thank you. Uh, the uh, newspaper project made me feel right at home. That was a very cute video, Pat, and uh, it's nice to see that uh, you're preserving the, the old print editions because you know, journalism is one of the fabric, you know, the keys to the fabric, I think, of most communities. Okay? All right. Better? Is that better? Okay. So, um, Pat approached me about talking in, as part of this uh, leadership series, and Kristen Bull, who was unable to uh, stay for, for my presentation, she hears me all day at Crane, so she probably doesn't want to hear me at night too, but her daughter has a choral concert tonight, so she, she had to scoot. She's a member of the Rochester School Board, and she's also an editor at Crane's Detroit Business. Um, that's why we have more and more Rochester news, I think, because Kristen is, is at Crane's. But um, it's always interesting to get an invitation um, to speak on a topic like leadership that's not what I think about every single day, although I'm, I'm watching it every single day because as a journalist for almost 40 years now, um, I have a front row seat at watching public figures, um, uh, corporate figures, and I'm able to um, just take away some lessons, but having this occasion, I, I can actually step back and think, think a little bit more clearly about the lessons that I've learned over time. And one of the things that I think it's easy to think about these days, especially when you saw that video about Bill Broomfield, you, you, you look at a guy of that stature and then you turn on CNN or Fox News and you wonder, where have our leaders gone? Um, now, sometimes it's the, you know, you think about the crazy presidential politics, the, uh, the rhetoric, uh, the meltdown of leadership and accountability in the Flint uh, water crisis. Speaking of water, <laughs> I'm glad I brought the golf's uh, umbrella. Um, and, and in Detroit, we, we are really good at one thing. We are very, very good at investigating corruption. And you, you saw that with the parade of principals that just went through court in the last few days. So maybe leadership is suffering in the public sector because in the 24-7 news cycle, nothing sacred, we cover everything, um, a lot of great leaders may feel less inclined to put themselves out there for the greater good. So tonight what I was going to do is uh, just share a few lessons and observations based on my journalism career in the 40, the 40 years, almost 40 years, and it will be 40 years next year, um, that I've spent in all the communities that you heard earlier. Six different daily newspapers, community newspapers, and then Crane's Detroit business since 1989. Um, so let me start with a simple question. And it, he has many answers. If I were to ask you what is leadership, how would you define it? Um, I'm not sure what your answer would be, but one, one definition is that it's the ability to inspire or persuade other people to follow your lead. And that kind of goes together. If you're a leader, you must have someone you're leading, which means you have some followers. 
When I first moved to Detroit in 1989, the first thing that I really noticed was uh, that we had a lot of news to cover. There were stories and cranes about big companies. Stroh was one of the big companies at the time. They were losing money. And, and so our, our basic coverage philosophy at Cranes is we cover who's making money, who's losing money, who's hiring, who's not, who's shedding jobs, and why. I mean, that's basically what business news is. Um, but if you talked about where the region was heading, you really didn't see a lot of business people talking about the future of Southeast Michigan. What you, what you really saw, and you saw the agenda being shaped for this whole region, was elected politicians. Brooks Patterson, whoever was the mayor in Detroit at the time was Coleman Young, uh, the Wayne County Executive, and then whoever was chairing the Macomb County Board of Commissioners. Those were what they called the big four, and almost any day of the week, those were the people that you saw quoted in the newspapers talking about where our region was moving. That is very, very different from where I came from on the west side of the state. I grew up in Grand Rapids, and that is a community that was so incredibly boring when I grew up. Uh, it was a dying downtown. It was, um, there really, uh, there, there were furniture, uh, office furniture companies, but the heyday of the fine furniture that, you know, gave the Grand Rapids the name, the Furniture City, that had long moved to the Carolinas. And Grand Rapids was okay, it was not in the doldrums, but it really wasn't very, a very dynamic community. And then in the 1960s and 70s, it seems as though the leaders in the privately held companies, and there are a lot of privately held companies in, in West Michigan, um, seem to wake up and realize, gee, if we want our own kids to stay here, if we want to attract talent to our companies in the Grand Rapids area, we better get our act together and start thinking a little bit differently. So, in the, in the 50s, 60s, 70s, there was this realization. It really took hold in the 70s, but something big happened in the 1950s, and it was led by business leaders, not necessarily politicians. Um, in the 50s, Grand Rapids business leaders decided that it would be in the region's best interest if it had a four-year university. So they lobbied hard, they raised money, and they persuaded the legislature to create what's now Grand Valley State University. I'm on the board of trustees there. Uh, it grew, it, the first class came in in 1963, very parallel kind of history to Saginaw Valley or even Oakland University in the sense of how new the university is. 25,500 students today. And 40% come from Southeast Michigan. And when I look back at the history of Grand Valley and what it's meant to Grand Rapids, first, I, I have to credit Bill Seedman. How many people have ever seen Bill Seedman? Uh, he's, 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 he passed away a few years ago, but he was a commentator on MSNBC, financial commentator. Um, he was part of the family, Seedman and Seedman, the, the accounting firm. He lobbied, he was the guy who really drove the, the establishment of Grand Valley. And, it was very political because Western Michigan University didn't want any competition on the west side of the state. Central Michigan University didn't want any competition. So the only way they got it through was to pick a point that was equidistant from Muskegon, Holland, Grand Haven, and Grand Rapids. And that is the town of Allendale in the middle of nowhere. It was cornfields. Um, and But that's where the university got its start. Now, Bill Seedman, uh, you know, I, I mentioned him because I thought, I think that that's when the, the business community in Grand Rapids really started galvanizing around a common purpose, a common purpose. And they were able to get this through the legislation, and Seedman went on to uh, being a key player. We've had so many meltdowns, you know, financial meltdowns. Not the one, the last one, but the one in the 80s with the savings and loan crisis. He was the guy who, at the federal level, ran the agency that disposed of all the assets that came to the government because all those savings and loans were closed and, and, um, and, and it cost pay, uh, taxpayers ultimately uh, a couple hundred million dollars, maybe even a billion. So uh, at that time, Seedman was a close friend of another low-key but remarkably effective leader, and that is our accidental president, Gerald R. Ford. When I was watching the video of Broomfield, I thought about Gerald Ford. 
We know the story. Jerry Ford was a good guy. He was a football player. He, he was actually elected kind of like Broomfield was, but after World War II. And he was elected to Congress on a reform kind of Republican ticket. There was a lot of corruption in Grand Rapids, and he beat the machine and won the primary and won the election. He was part of that era of moderate Republicans. Do you remember those? I mean, does anybody remember those? Um, and, uh, and, 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 and I think that's kind of an important thing because he could work both sides of the aisle. He knew how to work together with people to get something done. Uh, and then when he ultimately became president, after you know, serving as Nixon's vice president, um, you, know, you have to remember these history things. Uh, Spiro Agnew resigned in disgrace. Nixon uh, picked a Ford who was a congressional leader. And then when, when uh, Nixon resigned, Ford became the accidental president. And he, be, he was soon vilified for doing something that even, even now his critics say probably they, they, he was vilified at the time. But now I think history has said he did the right thing. He pardoned Richard Nixon. So uh, even though we didn't have 24-7 cable back then, can you imagine how paralyzing the uh, impeachment and the um, prosecution would be of Richard Nixon? So he was an amazing leader. And we kind of have, I think, a, a Hollywood notion of leadership, that, that leaders are very charismatic. I'm sure Bill Broomfield can command the room, but I wouldn't exactly say that he's Mr. Charisma or out of central casting as, as the most handsome, charismatic leader to come down the street. Either was uh, Gerald R. Ford. Um, so a couple of interesting notes about him. As he thought about leadership and talked to people who interviewed him about leadership and his philosophy of, of leadership and of management, first, he had a philosophy of building a staff around him in Congress and in the White House that would mix seasoned veterans with younger people. He really felt it was very important to have that mix because he wanted people to debate in his office. He did not want groupthink or a circle the wagons mentality. He wanted fresh eyes, new ideas, and he thought that the mix of staff, particularly bright young people and older seasoned veterans, was the way to get this done. Now, he, you know, he, he was a smart guy. People, you know, Chevy Chase made a lot of, he made his career um, portraying him on Saturday Night Live as kind of this bumbling guy. But this is a guy who went to U of M, and I believe he also went to law school at Yale. So um, not exactly uh, 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 someone who didn't have the academic chops. And he was a guy who got one day's notice that he would become president. One day's notice. Most people, if they're elected in November, they, uh, they, they kind of anticipate, and they know kind of who they're going to pull in for their team. This guy pulled the team together remarkably well and very quickly. That idea of who you surround yourself with reminds me of Mary Barra at, at General Motors. Um, talk about leadership in crisis. <laughs> um, there was a conspiracy theory there for a while that they handed the CEO slot over to her knowing that this ignition uh, scandal was going to break any day. I don't think that's true, but you can understand where that conspiracy theory came from. Um, she no sooner walked into her job that the ignition recall issue hit. She was testifying before Congress. She was made fun of on Saturday Night Live. I had the pleasure of interviewing her recently, and she made a couple of points about leadership that I thought was relevant to tonight. First, in her team, her senior leadership team, 50% of the senior leadership at GM has been at the company less than six years. Uh, and by design, General Motors went after people who were not born and bred in automotive when they had to fill key jobs. Their head of talent acquisition, for example, came from Google. So second, the ignition recall led to a company-wide speak up for safety campaign where the company told everyone from top to bottom that they wanted employees to speak up when they saw something that they didn't think was quite right. At the senior leadership level, when Mary Barr has her team, her key group team meetings, her cabinet level meetings, she is adamant about not having groupthink in the meeting. She wants uh, 
uh, she wants people, she cr intentionally creates a team where, in her words, we challenge each other. It's more like prove me wrong or make me think about it differently. And they have very robust debates. Now, what do you think might have happened if that were the culture in Governor Rick Snyder's office? Do you think we would be talking about Flint water if you had that kind of atmosphere? I, I love Governor Snyder. He's, he's, he's a great guy. He, he, I, I feel so badly for him because I think this Flint thing is defining his legacy. But he was very clear in his first term that numbers and metrics were the way he drove decisions. Uh, and he had very specific agendas, tax reform, putting more people to work, fostering trade between Michigan and China, because our last governor, before Governor Snyder, didn't want anything to do with China, and that, that isn't really a global reality to, to pretend that China doesn't exist. So his, his goals were very admirable, but I've worked, I know people who worked in his office, and I get the sense that if something was not on his agenda, he had his agenda, and I think that if it, if it wasn't on his agenda, it didn't get a lot of traction in the, in the team meetings. So I think one of the things that is a trait of a very good leader is the ability to listen. And another trait might be, to borrow from journalism, ask questions. Listening and asking questions is really kind of amazingly important, but people, sometimes people who have such high levels of subject expertise, who are often the smartest person in the room, I think they have trouble sometimes listening and asking questions because they think they already know all the answers. A good leader makes people feel comfortable to speak without judgment or retribution. They keep, like uh, uh, President Ford, they keep good counsel. A good leader stays positive. Rick Snyder is all over that. Relentless positive action, which you haven't heard too much lately, have you? Um, but, and a good leader encourages contributions because it's easier to get people to contribute if you know more about them and what makes them tick. And they feel safe expressing their opinion. So clearly, more questions should have been asked in the governor's office by the governor and by his senior advisors. I mean, did we all not see people trooping to the city council meetings in Flint with jars of water that looked like something I would never drink and I am sure none of you would ever drink? Another big key aha moment might have been when General Motors publicly announced it was not using Flint water anymore that was in 2015, I believe, early in 2015. It might have been late 2014. They were not using the city water. They were switching to the township water supply because it was ruining their parts. I, inquiring minds, would ask, hmm, if it's ruining GM's parts, maybe we should take a second look at these people who are bringing their jars of water to the city council meetings. So. You know, you, you, that's kind of a heads up. And it certainly, I would give credit, Kristen's not here, but you know, we reported that Rochester schools, because of what was happening in Flint, tested their water in March of 2015, months before the legislature was talking about requiring that of schools or helping to pay for that for schools. And there were a few issues that were discovered through that testing, and they're all being taken care of now. But nobody was asking enough questions at the state level, not just in the governor's office, but the DEQ and, and just about everywhere else. So we know that Gerald Ford, who I referenced earlier, he warned about groupthink. He thought that was a really bad, bad uh, uh, culture uh, to create. And as president, he had a great team, a diverse team in terms of age and experience. He wanted people to debate. And he was very uh, quick to figure out that as president, he had two agendas, and he tended to those agendas regardless of the political cost to himself. The first was healing the country, which he did by issuing the pardon that became so controversial. It was full and unconditional. The second was the economy. This is something that people don't remember. Maybe some, some of you do, 
But um, I do remember, I think I still have a whip inflation now pin. Um, but there was no new spending on programs would come in any budget that he passed, that he signed, uh, unless the budget was balanced, until the budget was balanced. He vetoed 66 bills. That's kind of remarkable. And I don't think he got a lot of credit. But talk about tone at the top. It was quiet, but it, it was with authority. He set the tone. He was down to earth. He oozed integrity. He put the national interest ahead of his political future. And I think that fits the mold that author Jim Collins, you know, Jim Collins, the good to great author. I think that's the kind of leadership he talks about and writes about when he talks about the death of the uh, charismatic leader myth. He's, Jim Collins thinks there is this myth about the charismatic leader. When he reviewed the companies that succeeded from one decade to the next, he often found it was not a charismatic hot dog who was leading the pack. It was somebody who really cared about the future and built institutionally a structure so that organization or that company would succeed beyond that, person, that leader's own tenure. That makes sense. If a company relies on a personality, what happens if the person gets hit by a truck, leaves for a better job, retires, or is, is disgraced? You do not want your company so closely identified with the leader, or its very identity could suffer when that leader is gone. I think that happened with uh, GE, with Jack Welch, for a while. And it's funny, because he got embroiled in a scandal shortly after leaving GE, if you remember that. Collins put it this way, a company's long-term health requires a leader who can infuse the company with its own sense of purpose instead of his or hers, and who can translate that purpose into action through mechanisms, not through force of personality. So I think that kind of actually, they, he was talking about a company, I think that really kind of describes Gerald Ford. Collins maintained that charismatic leaders weren't really an asset because they could be more of a liability. He proposed that the new type of company leader uh, should be more of an architect, someone who designed the mechanisms that would help reinforce uh, and give life to the company's core purpose that would carry that organization or that company forward, even through, through big changes. Now, I, my guess is that many of you in elected leadership in the room uh, have to worry about the day-to-day, -day, but you also want to focus on the communities that you serve, the organizations that you lead beyond your own tenure in the role you have today. This museum is remarkable in that respect. All of the time, the effort, the donations, the, the, the vision for, for capturing and saving and, and preserving the history of this region, it really is remarkable, and you have many, many people who no longer are here who have been part of that process. Uh, and I'm sure that there are projects and, and things that are happening both in the city of Rochester and in the city of Rochester Hills that, that speak to the same, uh, to the same ethic of, of looking forward to the future. My sense is that this area, people are very much looking to the future beyond, beyond today, just today. I bet there are a lot of architect leaders in this room, and, and that is Jim's, Jim Collins' prescription for leadership. But I personally think in this day and age, particularly in this political environment, it would really be nice to have a few more Jerry Fords and Bill Broomfields. But I am not sure either one of those gentlemen could survive a primary today. Thank you. And Pat said that if anybody had any questions, I'd be happy. It doesn't have to be about the, my remarks on leadership, but any kind of question about um, business, uh, Detroit, uh, the latest uh, corruption, whatever. <laughs> yes, there's a question here. Oh. Oh, okay. Well, someone asked about um, my own personal history, and that is so incredibly boring. Um, <laughs> but uh, let, let me um, see if I can uh, answer that pretty succinctly. I grew up in Grand Rapids. Uh, my mom and dad were 
um, did not go to college. They were um, uh, retail, they were in retail. Um, and I accused them, because they had six kids, I accused them of um, trying to st uh, staff their retail stores um, with cheap labor, <laughs> because all six of us worked in those stores. Um, so I grew up, you know, working, I had a really good work ethic. I thank them so much. Um, no long, they're no longer um, living, but the, the value that I got from working in the family business is something that I carry with me every day of my life, and it, it's such a gift. Um, I uh, uh, started in journalism. Um, I, I was actually a student at U University of Michigan for a year until I ran out of money and then transferred to Grand Valley. And actually that turned out to be the best thing for me because I was able to um, get an internship uh, in the summer at the Grand Rapids Press and you know, went on from there. And um, uh, as far as leadership and how I got where I am, you know, when I t talk to Mary Barra, I see in her, I don't, I'm not comparing myself to Mary Barra, but I see in her the same kinds of things that motivated me. She wants to win, and she works very hard. And when you work hard, you do get noticed. Um, and so I had some mentors along the way who talked me into going into management at a very young age. I was under 30. Uh, I was 26 when I became an editor. Um, supervising guys in their 50s who I, had been former colleagues. So that was a good experience too. Trying to lead, inspire guys who just, you know, had been doing this job for a very long time and knew a lot more than I did. It was, it was an interesting challenge. So I went through that and I've, I've been a manager really since I was 26 years old. Um, I've had one opportunity after another. I thank the Lord for uh, the job interview I had with Keith Crane in 1989, I just, we hit it off. I loved the idea that it was a family-owned company. Um, it's a big publishing company. We have 25 titles, Advertising Age, Automotive News. It's not just the Crane's Detroit business. It's a lot of different titles. And uh, been family-owned, now going into its third generation of family leadership. So, and he supported me in being the leader that I could grow to be in this role at Crane's Detroit Business. I will never forget that when I interviewed with him, I told him I wasn't really sure about moving to Detroit because I thought it was too big, and I really wanted to be um, the editor or publisher of a community paper and help set a community agenda. I really felt that small town, smaller town um, uh, ethic, I guess. And he said, that's what this is. This, you would be the editor of a community paper, only it's the business community in Southeast Michigan. It's everything that you want. And he was so right, and I, I'm so blessed to have had this job as long as I have and watched Detroit. As um, we, we did an event last fall, and Al Kaline spoke at it, and it was so cool to hear him say he had been in Detroit since 1953. And he said to the audience, that's probably longer than many of you have been alive, and he had seen Detroit, the good, the bad, and now he was living long enough to see the greatness come again. And despite me making a couple of jokes about the, the latest uh, corruption headlines, it is phenomenal what has been happening in, in Detroit. And it's partly in a great, great way. It is because of business leadership more than civic uh, political leadership. Um, what Roger Penske did uh, with the Super Bowl and getting people in the host committee in 2006, that set the stage for Dan Gilbert to come downtown to start buying property when nobody else wanted it, and it, th the rest is history. It's just remarkable. What the Illiches are doing, what Gilbert is doing, it's, it's, it, it, you can hardly believe that 2010 was the first it was the year that Gilbert first bought his, bought his first downtown building, um, and I'm so blessed to be part to be, yeah, you know, part of the the renaissance of Detroit. I'm very very lucky, and uh, um, I think the uh, the experience I had at the Detroit Athletic Club, um, what was interesting to me about that experience was I'm a joiner. I get involved in things, and uh, I cultivated a lot of people, a lot of people got to know me there, and even though a woman had never been elected president before, 
My core constituency were the older guys and the tap room bar crowd. Those are, those are my two core constituencies, and a lot of the women as well. So I hope that gave you a little insight to my background. Yeah. Any other question? Yes, over here. What is the take on Mayor, Mayor Mike Duggan? Well, uh, he is an extremely effective leader in terms of making people on his team accountable. Um, and I think that uh, at this point in time, Detroit is um, fortunate that he is the mayor because he can bridge a lot of things. Um, he bridges uh, communication with labor unions. He bridges, I mean, it was unheard of that he won a write-in campaign in a primary. And I, I, I just think that's remarkable. He was ready to write it off, and then somebody did some polling, and, and he was talked into running a, on a write-in uh, ballot. And um, I think that um, uh, the one, one, two things about where, where we might be going politically. I hope he doesn't run for governor. I hope he stays and runs again for mayor. Um, and I hope that whatever inquiry is being done on the land bank and any kind of contracts with contractors, that that is resolved quickly because G Detroit does not need any more investigations. Um, you need to be uh, over and above uh, board on all things and so there's some newspaper headlines now I hope that stuff is resolved and resolved very quickly one quick story about Mike Duggan um, he uh, was the CEO of the Detroit Medical Center which is a group of six or seven or eight hospitals and I'll, I'll never forget this guy who was a president of one of those hospitals telling me <laughs> that uh, when Mike came in one of the things that changed was he had a weekly meeting of all the presidents of all the hospitals, and he had a whiteboard in the front, and it had um, on the whiteboard by hospital how many admissions were projected or budgeted for the week before, and you had to come in on Tuesday morning or Wednesday morning, whatever, to this meeting, and you had to go up and write your numbers in, and if you didn't meet your numbers, you had to explain why. That is accountability. And I think that that is the kind of accountability he's bringing to Detroit, to city government. Other questions? Yes. Uh, we, uh, I got a microphone off back. Give you microphones. <laughs> so I'm going to talk for a while. No, um, you, we had the little film clip that uh, Pat had with the with the newspapers, mm -hmm. the old newspapers. We don't have those anymore. Right. And. It looks like that hundreds of year old tradition of, of local newspapers where you could you could put your hands on things. You, the elected officials could could uh, could speak out. Uh, people could have their little editorials in the local newspaper, and people could understand what what their neighbors were thinking. We don't have that anymore, yeah. and it, it's happened very suddenly. I mean, just in the last few years, we get a. Th th uh, we don't have any of those things. We got a three-day Detroit Free Press, you know, which wasn't really a local paper anyway. But the Oakland Press is is nothing. Uh, we don't have the Eccentric. We don't have the, the uh, Clarion. Um, those were the things that really kind of held communities together, I mm -hmm. think. And and, and uh, we've lost. Do you see any return to that in the future, or is it gone forever? That's a very good question. I, I, I wish there were a return. I mean, uh, first of all, I, I would be remiss if I didn't say you should go to the cranesdetroit.com web, web, website and sign up for our free Michigan morning email. <laughs> because a lot of people do get a lot of news from Cranes. I mean, we, have, uh, we, we break a lot of news every day, including things from Oakland County that might be relevant. But I totally get what you're saying, because I feel I mourn the, the uh, demise of, uh, or the reduction of professional journalism. Um, I used to joke that, um, you know, people, uh, you, you, pe people are saying nice things about, about the newspapers now, but there was a time that, you know, if I were going to a social function in Grand Rapids and they'd say, well, what do you do at the Grand Rapids Press? I said, well, I edit today's chuckle because I didn't even want to get into it, because people would always have a strong opinion about the Grand Rapids Press and say, you just did that to sell newspapers, or you know, they were angry about something that had been in the paper. But boy, do we miss it, because it, it is the community fabric. And 
I don't think digital is really the same thing because the, there is a serendipity of reading a newspaper where you are paging through it and you read things that you had no idea you were interested in. Online, you are basically reading what, um, you're, you're clicking on things or you're seeing things and you're not seeing the whole picture. You're not seeing all of the news. So there's that, that, that uh, lack of a curated newspaper where editors are saying, these, we know our readers, we think these stories are important and they're trying to present a smorgasbord of the kinds of relevant news for their, their audience. That is really hard to replicate online. Um, it's the worst mistake that uh, media in this country and just about everywhere made was they gave away the news. Everybody did, we did too. Um, we gave it away because we thought we could sell advertising on websites by having more eyeballs on the, on the website. And it really made news a commodity. And now, it, I don't know if it's too late to, to bring it back. I know that there are a lot of foundations that are supporting journalism in cities around the country. Um, we're still a, a, a very news-centric publication. We have a print edition. We do 14 newsletters a week some by industry, uh, but we have a morning e newsletter and we have an afternoon newsletter. And then we have one about nonprofits, we have one about manufacturing, we have one about healthcare. So we have all these niche things as well. Um, we thank God, knock on wood, we are making money and, and I can support, um, because I run the business, I can support our newsroom of professional journalists. I don't know what the answer is, but I do believe firmly that because the media mix now is talk radio and um, uh, cable networks that have points of view, that, that that has diminished our civic life in this country. And I think we're all poorer for that. I wish we could turn back the clock. I know that's not the, a great answer, but that's, that's all I can say. And any other questions? Yes. What yes. Ooh. Well, I think one of the things that um, appealed to me about journalism when I first started is that um, I get to learn something new every day and somebody pays me for it, which is kind of amazing. Uh, so even though I'm running the business now, I'm still pumped up about our news. When we get a scoop, I love that. And I'm very attuned to what's going on in our newsroom, even though I'm working with our advertising salespeople and our events management team and, and on that. So I would say that the, I still have that news bug and news drive. The other, the other thing that I think um, that I love is I can define what we do at Crane a little more broadly. Uh, and we do things that I think build community. Um, let me give you an example. Uh, and this has been a very um, satisfying experience. Um, in 2014, an old friend of Keith Crane's, who was retired publisher of Fortune magazine, came to him with this idea that Detroit would need investment um, after coming out of bankruptcy. And what if you were able to tap expats, people who grew up in the Detroit area but were successful and lived somewhere else? Would you, would, if you could get them to come back for a unique experience, could that lead to investment? And um, that I got so excited about the idea that I went out and I talked to a couple of foundations and a couple of corporate type leaders and said, what if we did this? What would you, would you help pay for it? And, um, and they said, well, how would you measure success? And I say, well, how many people we get and what kind of investment eventually is made? Um, and we set a goal of having 50 people the first year. Uh, we got 150. Last year, we got 175. And this year we're planning the event um, for, sept for September, it's two and a half days, and Steve Ballmer, who's an expat, is our lead speaker. And we're tracking $240 million in pending investments by people who grew up in the Detroit area because the more successful you get and the older you get, I think, I, I think the more you think, remember where you came from. And there's a very strong emotional connection that many successful people have with, with Detroit, even if they grew up in Farmington Hills 
or Birmingham or uh, Westland. Um, and, and that's what we're building on. We're building this community of Detroit expats who are motivated and inspired to do something for their old hometown. And I'm very proud of that. And I think that, having things like that, that I can say, I was part of that. I did, I did that. I, my team and I did that. I think that that is really kind of the reinforcing thing that gets me to uh, wake, you know, come to work in the morning excited about doing my job. Yeah. Any other questions? Well, thank you so much. I really appreciated your um, questions and your attention, and I enjoyed the evening very much. Great. Thank, thank you, you very much, Mary.